Welcome to another episode, our Deep Dive episode podcast with our special, special guest and friend, Dave Rubin. So happy to have you back. It's been about four months. And I know the last time we talked, you were about to move to Florida. So I'm assuming you are situated and comfortable and loving it. I am situated. I am comfortable. I am loving it. I am tan. It's all good here <laughs> in the free state of Florida. I honestly, in my adult life, I don't know that I've ever been happier. It, it's such a difference, a stark and profound difference living in the dystopian nightmare of Los Angeles to moving to the free state of Florida. Uh, I live in Miami in the suburbs over here. And it's just, it's not just the weather and it's not just the lizards and the iguanas <laughs> and the peacocks and all that stuff. It's that people smile. Look at the two of you. You're mm -hmm. Floridians at heart, I can tell, even if you're not actually Floridians, because you're both smiling and I can see your teeth and you're happy. And in, in Los Angeles, these people were so depressed, I kid you not, their faces were sliding off their skulls. The endless misery, the depression, even they're all on drugs too, and it didn't even help them. Uh, yeah. So I'm very happy yeah. to be here in Florida. Yeah, I can, well, good, I can see that. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say I'm in Texas and we're somewhat free here. I mean, it's like a close second to Florida, which is the the smile. But Miriam just smiles all the time anyway. She's just endlessly <laughs> smiling. So that explains well, her who, smile. Well, who who would have thought that Florida actually would be the tip of the spear of freedom more than Texas? And, right. and that really is the case at the moment. I mean, DeSantis mm -hmm. has this place lined up so well, not because he wants to be king, but just because he wants the government out of our lives and go wrestle alligators while smoking a cigar and rescuing the dog, right. if that's what you wanna do, go right. do it. And that's what he's setting us right. up for. You guys have a little, even though Texas I think will be fine and, and this Beto moron, don't worry about him, but yeah, I you know, hope not. It's, yeah. it's a little more murky in Texas than than it should be. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hate I hate that there's even talk of it becoming the least bit purple, which does concern me because it's like all the freaks from California have sort of transcended and, and moved here. And we're like, you know, you guys can just stay, stay there and leave your politics there. That drives me crazy that so many Are you of them seeing that? Here. Are you seeing that the people oh. that are moving are, but can you tell which way they're gonna vote? Cause I can tell you very clearly from being here, I'm meeting a ton of refugees from New York and Cali, Jersey, Connecticut, all the usual spots and everyone, and I get it, I'm a self-selected, the people that say hi to me already have a certain set of views, let's right, say. Right. But everyone that I'm meeting here, and I'm meeting a lot of people here, people that are coming up to me in the supermarket elsewhere, saying, hey Dave, I just got here from Jersey, I'm gonna vote Republican for the first time, or Dave, I'm just like you, I left Los Angeles, I'm never voting for a Democrat again, et cetera, et cetera. So I, my hope is that the people that move get it, but obviously not everybody will. I think, I think the people that live in my neighborhood, because I live out in the country, you know, we have a little ranch out here and I live out in the country. So the people that move where I live, and they, I would say that most of those people are conservative. The people that I see driving down the road, like when I'm out on 35, the big interstate here, which is like the big pipeline down here, I see a lot of like, you know, the Subarus with the Beto bumper stickers and stuff like that, that you could just tell, like those, they are an out-of-towners that, that you can tell those people, those are the transplants who are trying to come here and they're trying to make it California. And so, you know, I mean, you, they the, exist. The truth is, the truth is, and I, I really do, I'm not kidding, every time when I've met neighbors that have come up and you know dropped cookies off at our door to welcome us here, which that never happened in LA, but it so happens sweet. here. I yeah. say to everybody, I mean, I say the same line to everyone, I'm here to keep Florida, Florida. But right. I think for, for people like you that are in Texas, or if, if you're in a red state right now and you're getting this influx of people, I know it can be a little unnerving at some level. In some ways it's nice because your house is probably worth more now. There's some economic activity, that's right. all good but you don't want that that evil infection that has destroyed those places, that parasite no. to move to your state. But it mm -hmm. does present a really nice opportunity because if your neighbor you know, moves out and then you get these influx people from Cali and you're not really sure where they're at, I guarantee if you talk to them for a little bit, you invite them over for dinner or for some wine, whatever, and you start trying to like figure out what's really going on there, they're gonna be malleable because these people just picked up and moved for a reason. They didn't move, right. they didn't move because they want higher taxes. They didn't move because they want more lockdowns. So the entropy is already pushing them one way. And I think with a smile and a little openness and all that stuff, you actually can convert some of these people. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that attitude. I think that you're absolutely 100% correct on that. You've got a yeah. mission now. You've got a mission. I so can get out there. 
<laughs> Listen, we've been known to con- we've been known to convert people. We've been known That's to take true. to take liberals and turn them into conservatives. It takes a little bit of time. It takes some sweetness, a little snark mixed in there. But we've been known to do it. Yeah. Weird and that, that we know that that's, that's the most true about thing you and, too. And yeah, has there ever been a time more ripe for that? You know, right? Mm-hmm. With everything that's happened over these last two years, when I was living in Los Angeles and we had these crazy lockdowns and all of this stuff, and you may may remember the one of the famous ones. Of course, the most famous was when Gavin Newsom went to French Laundry, the most expensive yeah. restaurant in the United States, twenty thousand dollars on alcohol while he sat with lobbyists without a mask. Putting that one aside, the other the other really famous one, but maybe it didn't get out of L.A. as much as, as it should have. There was a, a L.A. supervisor named Sheila Cool, who was the one that decided she was the three two deciding vote to close outdoor dining in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, where it's 80 and sunny every single day. She left the meeting. And where did she go? Because she knew it wasn't going to kick in for 24 hours to go sit outside at her favorite restaurant in Santa Monica. And I ended up protesting at her house a day or two later. I don't love the idea of protesting at people's houses. That's where they just decided to do it. That's the very location that I signed the recall for Gavin Newsom because these people, they don't even believe their own BS. If she she feared it at all when she signed that last thing, that three, two deciding vote, three, five bureaucrats, you know, but in essence, three bureaucrats to destroy (laughs) all of those lives and businesses. If she believed it at all, she would have gone right back home, wrapped herself in saran wrap and gone to the basement and, you know, Precisely. Done whatever. but instead she right. really wanted some pasta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, it's kind of like we talked about this morning, this whole idea of Saki, Jen Saki on Friday, Ugh. insisting that Kamala Harris was wearing a mask indoors for Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation. And then now today, this afternoon, admitting, well, she wasn't, but it was because what she was doing was so important. <laughs> and right. I'm it like, was very important. It was, it was very historic. Important. And yeah. that's the incredible thing. And I, I have the science in front of me, guys, right now. <laughs> COVID actually does not transmit if you're doing something important, particularly right. oh. if you're doing something important that coincides with the left's narrative. So mm-hmm. if you are, say, burning down a building in the name of tolerance, you can't get COVID. If you're out there for Black Lives Matter, you can't get COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. if you're protesting government overreach, then almost completely you will get COVID. It's a super spreader (laughs) event and you should be taken to Gulag 13A. Right. Follow the science, science. you guys. It's science. Follow Follow the science. That's right. Just follow it. Okay. We got to talk about your new book. It comes out tomorrow or by the time this podcast is released today. Uh, And your book is called Don't Burn This Country, (laughs) Surviving and Thriving in the Woke Dystopia. So I know we have not read this book yet. We were not on the list of of recipients that got the... I know. So we can't get the book. Come on. All right. All right. Michael. (laughs) Chicks on the right, get them the book. We the heard they were covered. Right. They were covered in gold. Like we wanted to All get right. the ones that were like really special and covered in gold and everything. We've yeah. got. There's a so, couple extra special boxes here. Okay. Forget it. My parents aren't getting the book. Get it to the girls. <laughs> Screw I don't your know what parents. There. You were on my list. Yeah. I had a list that I wrote out. You were on my list. It's okay. Okay, good. Well, so we we can't speak from like experience of reading it, but we know from the description and obviously from the title that you're going to offer information about how to survive what's going on in our world right now. So what, give us a morsel, give us something like what, give us the teaser that you're giving to other people about what they can expect out of this book. Yeah. Well, in many ways, it's part two of what I now realize will be a trilogy. When I wrote the first book, I didn't think I was going to write a second book. Now I sort of having written the second realized that there will be a third because the first book, don't burn this book, was laying out (laughs) the ideas that I think are the best ideas for a flourishing country and really for you individually to flourish yourself. That being said, although I think it was quite a good book and it, it sold a lot of copies, obviously the woke machine has marched on. The ideas of collectivism have continued, socialism and communism and all of this insanity that we're seeing it still is moving on us, right? So this book really is how can you personally not just survive, but thrive in the midst of this? We already talked about one of the things that I lay out, which is that if you just change your geography, I mean, take your life seriously enough to say, man, if I'm living in a place that is taxing me to high hell, where the roads you know, are falling apart, homelessness is 
all over the place, crime and drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Say New York City, say Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, et cetera. Get going, get going. There are things that you can do in your life. You know, don't be so reliant just on big tech. There are ways either through decentralized platforms or locals, which I started, or Rumble. There are ways right. off some of the big platforms that eventually will silence you or unperson you. The whole book is really designed, know how to do a couple things. Don't think because they say, hey, you got to go get a four-year degree that you got to walk out of a college after majoring in lesbian dance theory that, you know, <laughs> and $100,000 into debt, no offense to the lesbians, that... Uh, <laughs> Or the lesbian you dancers. Like that um, <laughs> that, that mean, that's the way to do it. You know, learn a trade. There's all sorts of things. You know, one of the great things uh, that I'm so proud of that almost was an accident in this book was that I write in the book about my intern from about two years ago because it takes a long time to get a book published. You write it and then it takes about a year to sit. Right. Whatever else. So I wrote the book about a year and a half ago. At the time, my intern, Phoenix, was a great kid, he was going to school, and I just saw a bright future with him. And I said to him one day, I said, listen, forget about school. This was when COVID had started. So I said, listen, forget school, you're doing this Zoom stuff, it doesn't make sense. Drop out of school, let me give you a job. And he said, "You know, Dave, I really appreciate that, but I just wanna stick with it a little bit longer. Well, I'm very proud to say that in the year and a half since writing the book, because I write that very story in there, um, he dropped out of school, he now works for me, he's my associate producer, he moved to Florida, he's living on his own, he's making good money. And, and he's th uh, flourishing, he's thriving. And that, that is a beautiful thing. There are ways to just say to the system, I just refuse to play. I get it, right. you want us all to be miserable. You want all our money, you want all of our time, you want all of our attention. I'm just not gonna do it. Right, I it's like going, buck, bucking the narrative, you know? Yeah, bucking the script. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I love it, that's awesome. I love it. So I know uh, Amy Jo wanted to ask about Elon Musk and, and the yes. fact that he's like now twi like owns a bunch of Twitter, probably going to own a bunch more of Twitter. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was he was uh, there was chatter about him perhaps starting his own deal for a while. That's exactly what you did with locals, which, by the way, we're very happy to be there. <laughs> oh, my God. We, lo we love. Platform. Yes, we absolutely love locals. We love everything. The, the fact that there's actual customer service at locals, it's like we're like, what is this? What's even we happening? To talk to people. people? There are we people hire here? people to yeah. respond to emails. Yeah. It's rather incredible. I don't know yeah, how we came up with that one. But the, the Elon remarkable. Musk thing is the Elon Musk thing is actually, although obviously this has all transpired since I wrote the book, it's it's very much in line with the book because it's about an individual saying, "What can I do to solve a problem?" So yeah. look, Elon Musk he bought this nine point two percent of Twitter, so he's the largest stakeholder in Twitter, um, but he's obviously not a majority stakeholder. As you may have heard, just in the last twenty four hours, they had originally said you're going to get a board seat. Now they're taking that back. It's a little unclear what's going on there. My guess is that there was massive pushback because they, they are a woke corporation with all sorts of woke employees who are not happy that free speech might be defended a little bit more with him as part of it. But from what I understand, um, if he had stayed on the board, he would have only been able to have purchased a, about another 5% of the company, would right, have put him right. at about 14 and percent. Mm -hmm. Now, by not being on the board, he can actually do a hostile takeover of the company, yeah. meaning, <laughs> meaning he can buy that 50.1%. So Twitter may have really stepped in it here. You know, the guy uh, who replaced Jack Dorsey, I think he's woke. He doesn't fully get it. You know, they keep debating, okay, well, let's have an edit button or let's change this or that. It's like, we need a whole new ecosystem. This isn't about, oh, now we can edit tweets. We've solved the problem. It's like, maybe, maybe what Elon Musk was about to do was gonna do some digging and find out who killed the Hunter Biden laptop story at Twitter. Maybe they didn't want that <laughs> being found out. I mean, yeah. who knows, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I just love it. I love the prospect of him even going there. I just like the fact that he's shaking things up so much that he's making all those guys just like freak out. They're all just like, oh my God, what is he's here? And he's like, I don't, we don't like him here. And they're crying. And they're, I just, they're just being ridiculous about it. And it's, yeah, and it's just, well, but he's also just supposed imagine to be like, this guy, he creates electric cars. The Tesla is the coolest freaking thing ever. He sent right. a Tesla to space just for the hell of it. He's creating, you know, he's doing SpaceX, obviously. He's got the Boring mm -hmm. Company, which is literally creating under underground tunnels for the future of transportation. It's like, this is the type of guy we should all be emulating. I'm not saying he's yes. perfect, but this is a creator and a fighter and an innovator. And instead, woke corporations are freaking out that he's part. Um, I yeah. assure you, I, although I, you know, we, we merged with Rumble, so I don't own locals anymore. I assure you that if 
At any point, Elon Musk had bought 9.2% of locals, I would have been pretty freaking thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but see, and I that's the thing. Though. For ten bucks, I am not kidding. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the thing, though, Dave, is that we don't honor and celebrate innovation anymore. You know, everybody celebrates groupthink and not innovation. So guys like Elon Musk aren't really celebrated. I mean, that's it. Used to be the guys like he's he's sort of like what people like that used to be celebrated. They're not anymore, and it's a it's a true shame. Which brings me to the Disney thing, Disney of yore. You know, because we're I'm fifty years old. And so I remember back in the day when Disney was a place where, I, listen, I've never really liked Disney, to be honest. Like you can look at our site and look up articles where I've just completely reamed. I, I, I've not liked Disney for probably 15 to 20 years. And so I'm like, I feel like the OG of loathing Disney kind of, <laughs> it's, but the, cause I just haven't. And people have gotten really mad at me because I've written a lot of stuff about how much I don't like Disney over the past 15 to 20 years. And now all this stuff is happening. And I, and I look back on when we were children, you know, when, when Miriam and I were children and Disney was this magical place, right? And I look at what they're doing to this company. And again, it's the group thing coming in. And it's like, what I just would love to give your thoughts quickly on what you think about Disney and what's happening well, there. Well, first off, I give you mad props. I think that's what the kids say now. Mad <laughs> props on, on turning on Disney before the average person, because now it's pretty <laughs> obvious. And, and I honestly think, I think this could destroy Disney. I don't mean that the company will not exist in one form or another, but I think they have now imported such a horrific set of ideas that is proliferating throughout the company with this ridiculously pathetic, there's no other way to describe him, pathetic CEO, that this could cause a core implosion of all of their real products and the trust they had built and the cultural phenomenon that they are. Before I get into the kids stuff, I mean, I can tell you this, in the last 10 years, I've really hate to come, I've really come to hate Disney because they destroyed Star Wars, which was the stuff of my childhood dreams. You know. When right. George Lucas created Star Wars, it's not just the story of Darth Vader and C-3PO and the rest of that and the imagination and all that. He was actually also fighting the studio system. There, there's all sorts of great documentaries you can watch on this, but he was the outsider fighting them. One of the reasons he became so rich was because they were giving him such crappy deals, the, the, the main studios, that he said, okay, I'll keep the toys because toys didn't, male action figures didn't really exist. He ended, he ended up making billions and billions of dollars. On that Brilliant, stuff. yeah. But, but what's interesting yeah. is the story of Star Wars, you know, the little guy, Luke, destroying the Death Star, the redemption of his father. In some ways, that was what George Lucas was trying to do. He was trying to destroy the Hollywood system, all this stuff. Anyway, flash forward 30 years, he ends up selling to Disney. I don't begrudge him for doing it, by the way, because, you know, the fans really had turned on him because of the prequels as much as I actually really like the prequels. But the fans had turned on him. He just said, okay, maybe someone else can do something better. The reason I mention all this, though, is that Disney has become the villain of a Disney movie. You hand beautiful pieces of art to them. Look what they've done with the Marvel movies. They're all exactly the same. You can't right. have a giant corporation, even if Disney was not woke, you can't have a giant corporation own all of our dreams, all of the stories of the day. So that's yeah. why the, the Star Wars posters look exactly like the Marvel posters. Every Marvel movie, you know exactly what's gonna happen. The Star yeah. Wars stories, you know what they did? A lot of people don't know this because Star War, Disney was running Star Wars and Marvel. They purposely in their marketing, they tried in the last trilogy, which was terrible, the Star Wars trilogy, they tried to market that more towards girls and Marvel, they said, would be for boys. These are the same people oh who say there's no such thing as gender. Right. The sim but the simple <laughs> truth is, of course, you could be a girl and like Star Wars. But the idea that they said we have to now push ideas this way to this set of people based on their gender. It's all just terrible. And then of course, yes, to really get to what you're asking about, the fact that Disney as a corporation that happens to be based in Florida thinks that they get to control what our kids are educated about more than the governor uh, yeah. is completely insane. I thought that the left was against corporate power, but I guess they really love corporate power mm -hmm. now. And to watch, again, this CEO, Chappick, I think is his name, watch him grovel to the LGBTQILMNOP group and say he'll be a better ally. And it's like, man, get some balls. Can I say balls? You yeah, say oh, we say balls. Right? We say, say balls. balls all the time. In fact, okay, we usually so do balls. this. When get we some, say balls, we say get some balls. balls. When we say that. We say get some balls. Yeah, that's right. what we say. Yeah. That's okay, what we well, can do. we?
Um, can we shift this to a little more of your personal news that you shared yes, just a few sure. weeks ago? Very, very exciting that you are going to be expanding your family and you have not one, but two little baby boys on the way. Um, and I, and I noticed that in, in the midst of all of the amazing support that you got, there were, as you could predict, some naysayers. And I know that you recently had a pretty uh, open and honest conversation with Glenn Beck about that, who's, of course, coming from a, a, a really religious angle on his viewpoints. Can you talk to us about that conversation and how you have responded to him as well as other conservatives who are now like, oh, we love Dave, but we don't love this. How, how have you responded to that? Sure. First off, let me say that Glenn Beck, uh, you know, I've met all the people that you've met. I've met all those people. Glenn Beck may be the nicest, most decent guy in this entire industry, if not one of the nicest people I've met on planet Earth. I mean, I have I have had, you know, crying sessions with the guy. He, this is a good, good, decent man and a true friend. And I, you know, when we made that announcement and we put the picture up uh, announcing that we were having kids and we did get some backlash, which I'll address in just a sec. Glenn emailed me, I think within the hour, and he said, um, well, he said, he first said congratulations, <laughs> and he said, could we talk about this tomorrow? Is, is, there, is there more that we can talk about here that would be rich to be talking about? Uh, he said, nothing's off the table, and if you want to do it, I I'd love to do it. And of course I said, yeah, yes, let's do it. And there are important things to talk about here. So first off, on some of the negative backlash part, um, you know, it's, this is a funny thing about how the internet really has dysregulated all of us, because when the day was done after we made that announcement and my tweet got, I don't know, 40,000 retweets and videos got all the views and blah, blah, blah. And I try not to pay attention too much to that kind of stuff. Um, I thought the reaction was 99% positive. Virtually everyone that I'm associated with publicly or privately either messaged me on Twitter publicly or they called me or texted me and it was all love. Now, were there people on Twitter, there were two or three blue check people who through a religious perspective, we're saying things that I didn't think were particularly nice, but they're entitled to their religious liberty. And then you get like a gajillion anonymous trolls just saying right. all sorts of awful things. But the right. but what's interesting about that is, you know, if you had a video with a million views, if you guys put up a video and it has a million views, 975,000 people don't comment. That's how it works. That's how the internet mm -hmm. works. People have lives. So they watch the video, they go, oh, I kind of agreed with the ladies. Maybe I didn't, but I got to go do some stuff. Right. Now there's 25,000 people that respond, right? Now, out of those people, we know that the commenters usually are negative. That's just how it works. And the more negative you are, the more upvotes you're going to get. So the, so then people would might go to your video where a million people watch, 975,000 might have loved you, but they're going to look in the comments and go, boy, these people really hate them or something like that. So I felt mm -hmm. that the, and that's what I mean by dysregulated, the, the response I was getting, I was getting a response to the response. Mm. more than more than any reality. Nobody that I know publicly, whether it was the guys at the Daily Wire or at the Blaze or at Prager or, or YAL or YAF or any of the places that are all conservative that associate with me, not one person that I know of turned on me. Forbes wrote an article the next day, Dave Rubin's friends and allies turn on him or friends and audience turn on him. We had our best month ever on YouTube last <laughs> month and I'm trying to drive all my people to rumble and they used a picture of me and Candace Owens. Candace Owens, who was at my house two weeks ago helping us pick out strollers because she <laughs> has one kid and she's pregnant. So they lie about absolutely everything. Yeah, that, yeah. That being, that being said, um, there are legitimate issues to talk about. I am talking to two women, two mothers. Uh, you're both mothers, right? You're both, yeah. Yep. And, and I, in no way, m myself nor my husband, think that women and mothers are not important. So we are going to do all sorts of things relative to building the best family that we have. can have. Uh, his mom is going to come down and live with us for a couple months. His sister, who is a nanny for, for young children, is also going to be moving in with us for a couple months. My sister, who lives in Miami, a couple miles away, she's pregnant with her third, who's due the day before our first, and obviously will spend a lot of time. My mom, uh, part-time, lives in Florida. So it's, I'm not saying it's the exact thing that we all see, but I think this is where, and this, I do get into this in the book, uh, partly related to this. If, if from the conservative perspective, if you believe that family is important and it's, a, it's the basic building block of civilization, so you've got individuals, you've got family, you've got community, and we can kind of work our way up. Well, I'm with you on that. Family might look a little bit different. 
and and we can all negotiate that. But you know what? There's a pl- there's plenty of straight families that the father abandons them, or the mother's abusive, or someone's an alcoholic, or a drug addict, or or a litany of other things. And I think the best thing you can do is is try to live the best self actualized life that you can, and see what happens. But we'll need all sorts of advice from everyone, including you guys. You know, like that's that's the thing. But in but I get the concerns. I mean, that's the irony. I I do get the concerns. Um, but you know, you can also look at there's all sorts of studies that that kids that are raised in by same sex parents often ha- have higher test scores and turn out to have better paying jobs. Not that that's a full arbiter of everything. And I'm not saying I'm not saying one thing's necessarily better. Things are different in the world. It's how it is. Um, but point is, we should be allowed to discuss these things without all the crazy haters jumping in and making a mess of everything. But you're right. We should be. You're right. Yeah. We should be allowed to discuss yeah. these things with, with, without all the whackness and the craziness. Yeah. And yeah. Well, Look, it it's was, real. It You'd so be crazy. Good. It was so good that you and Glenn had those differences on the fundamental issue of, you know, gay couples having kids or surrogacy in general. And 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 I thought you you were both such a good example of, listen, we can disagree on things and still love each right. other like crazy. And well, and I mm-hmm. hope that that is a message that carries beyond just that podcast, but into Amen. all of our communications. Well, that Amen. was the funny thing because, you know, we put Glenn and the Blaze guys put the clip up of me talking to him. And then all these leftists who, again, pretend to be the diverse, tolerant, these people, oh they're, telling, gosh, they're yeah. yelling at me, telling me I'm a self-hating gay and Glenn's a homophobe. And it's like, here we are really <sighs> trying to wade through some, some important stuff, some, you know, right. like some deep, profound stuff. And, you know, by the way, you know, when it comes to motherhood, particularly, you know, Men and women, I hate to tell the Disney people, but men and women are different, right? So generally speaking, men like things and women like people, but that's not always how it is. Women usually are more nurturing, but not always. And men usually are fixing cars as opposed to, you know, like really like rocking the kid to sleep. But I'm sure in your, both of your relationships, you also know that there are private moments that are a little bit different and all those things. I don't think I'm going to be the most nurturing personally myself, but my husband actually is a lot of that. Now, he can't be all of exactly what a mother would be, which, again, is why I said we're going to have these uh, female influences around. But that's all part of trying to to build something that's good and sustainable and all of those things. And uh, and it's not denying biology or reality or anything else. Yeah. The book, uh, again, is Don't Burn This Country, Surviving and Thriving in Our Woke Dystopia. We know you have another uh, call to get to. I know. Take more of your time. This flew by, though. It, yeah. it did. Oh my God, we could that keep was talking a half to hour? you forever. Jeez. It wow, was really, thirty-five was minutes. We could keep talking to you forever. So we really appreciate your time, Dave. And it's just always lovely talking to you. It was my pleasure, ladies. We are sending you books today, Phoenix. I gave you a shout out on the show. <laughs> gold plated, gold plated. That should have been your parents. <laughs> well, I don't know that there was gold in the original, but no? I'll, I'll see if we can get no? we'll throw okay. something in there. Can for you a little actually extra. start Catheter a match, though, on them? Does the match, match right. actually yes. light? Does it you actually tell me. We're going to send it to you. You'll let me know. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We Thank appreciate you guys. it. Take care. Bye.